So tonight's topic is living with Arizona's wildlife. Um, we're going to talk about some of the common urban wildlife with the emphasis on coyotes, and that's probably a reason why a lot of you are here. Um, we're going to talk about what, what those animals need, and then we're going to talk about why they're in your neighborhood. Okay? And then we're going to shift focus, and then we're going to talk about how do we deal with these animals, deal with them, deal with them on our terms, um, things that we have control over, changing our own behavior, changing the things, or moving some of the things as to why they're coming into our yards and neighborhoods. Um, and then kind of getting everyone together and kind of working together. Uh, I want to thank the City of Scottsdale for hosting this. Um, we did the same program last week at Civic Center li Library. Uh, we had one person show up, so <laughs> yeah. So kind of, you know, a little bit different and stuff though. So it kind of shows, you know, the, the difference in locations and stuff though as to, you know, what are the issues that are going on. But, you know, there were some issues going on down around like that uh, Coronado Golf Course area, long needing been washed there. Uh, but again, there was only one person that showed up. So that tells us a lot too and stuff though. But I want to thank you all for coming out here. It's a lot easier for me to speak to, I don't know, 30 some people uh, all at once than to speak to you all individually on the phone, okay? So why are these animals in my neighborhood or why are they in the city? Well, at one point, you know, many years ago, before the hospital and everything was here, you know, this was open desert land or probably ranch land at that point, stuff though, with cattle out here. There were some coyotes out here, but when we, big machines came in and bladed it for our, for our own living, those animals temporarily moved out. And then what we did as putting green grass in a desert, putting water sources out there, we've put, opened up the uh, red carpet, invited a lot of critters to come in. For a lot of the way, reasons why we live in this area, a lot of the same reasons why these coyotes and javelina and, and bobcats have moved in as well, okay? So for a lot of these animals, life is certainly easier within your neighborhood or your community than it is, you know, in the, on the desert or even on the Salt River, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Reservation. And for some animals, we certainly have higher concentrations um, living in these areas than what can be supported out there in the desert. So what attracts wildlife to an area? And wildlife or animals need habitat. And habitat, habitat is made up of four things. Most people think of food, water, and cover, right? Okay, but most people also don't think about space, okay? Uh, for example, um, different animals need different arrangements of space. A ground squirrel can live in your backyard and probably call it good his whole life. Whereas a uh, mountain lion needs, you know, 100 to 300 some square miles in order for that, that, that to call home, okay? So for a coyotes, for example, you know, within any golf course, there may be two or three different territories within that same golf course. Because a lot of these areas, these amenities that we provide also pr allow for those more species or more of those animals to survive in that area. So some of the common water sources, your pools, your bird baths, uh, low bushes or shrubs near the hiding cover or that provide hiding cover near uh, food sources, um, bird feeders and bird seed. Um, birds are messy eaters. A lot of that bird seed will end up on the ground. Uh, pet food that's left out, either for feral cats or outdoor cats or for your outdoor dogs can, you know, bird, can attract birds and other critters as well. Uh, and then this is the things that I typically deal with and where the conflict really rises is when we start dealing about small pets and, and uh, pet concerns, okay? But the reality is when these animals have access to habitat, so all of the, the conditions that they need to survive and they get access to these areas within our, within our parks, within our neighborhoods, and within our, in our, uh, within our uh, home area as well, okay? So when they have access to it without us pushing back and not getting any kind of negative consequences for them being there, that's when, like I said, rolling out the red carpet, so to speak, for these animals. So pretty typical, you put green grass in a desert, you got rabbits, right? And then rabbits are low on the food chain, so that attracts a whole lot of other critters. We got, um, you know, bobcats, um, coyotes. Um, but the other thing we don't think about, though, is the winged predators. So this, this slide here, I, I, I got out of my truck and stuff, though, walked over here. I expected that to be filled with dog food, you know. There is an issue, some, some issues in parts, of the, in parts of the city where people are feeding wildlife, okay. 
This was actually empty. There was no remnants of dog food or anything else. But just to show you, they, they do put out, uh, you know, hummingbird uh, water for the hummingbirds as well. And so kind of just, you know, these people obviously enjoy the wildlife, probably enjoy the javelina that are in the area. Um, one thing is, you know, within Scottsdale or within the, the Phoenix metropolitan area, the animals that we're dealing with have never dealt with drought issues. And it's probably gonna start happening if you know, once the Colorado River starts continuing to dry up and we start having to, to uh, drain our golf course ponds, drain our pools and things like that. But really, if you look at a, an aerial view, just of your neighborhood, there's water everywhere, okay? This is my low hanging fruit slide. I almost expected to see javelina bedded down here in the summertime. These uh, citrus probably, the, the evapotranspiration of citrus, uh, probably 10 degrees cooler in there, you know, oranges right there, and you expect them to maybe pull up those drip sprinklers to create a wet environment to lay in as well. So some of the common animals that we have here uh, in the Phoenix metropolitan area or urban areas. Um, and the reality is a lot of these critters over here and over here, they're more generalist type animals means they eat a variety of things and they can survive or they, their habitats are, have a, a wide range of locations. Coyotes eat almost anything, that's why they're, they're, they're found throughout the entire U.S., okay? Well, except Hawaii, right? And Alaska? No, not Alaska. Yeah. Hawaii or Alaska too? Oh, yeah. So, but like I said, most people don't think about these winged predators over here. The hawks and the owls and stuff though, and I imagine a lot of cats go missing and probably get taken by great horned owls. Cats go roaming at night, and unfortunately, great horned owls are out hunting at night too. So we got our uh, main problem animal here is our coyotes, uh, followed in order by javelina than bobcats. One year we actually had more bobcat calls than we did javelina, um, and then you know these are kind of always around our foxes, our skunks, our raccoons, and. <coughs> Where, where you see these animals, almost always it's tied to feral cat colonies and cat food that's outside that, that's available for these animals, okay? And then if you look out, look out the front door here, you look at the mountains and stuff though, there are mountain lions at the, in the mount, uh, McDowell Mountains. Okay, so focus today is on urban coyotes. And like I said, the reason for that is, is a couple things and stuff because one, it's our number one problem animal. Uh, but two, it's also because a lot of things that we can talk about and deal with with these coyotes, uh, the, the self-help and the methods we can use uh, work for a lot of these critters as well, okay? okay. So... This is, my, this is where I do a little disclaimer. Um, one thing is, you know, we don't want to, you know, overly make light of a situation that could be potentially dangerous. But the other thing is we don't want to put you to sleep either. So there is kind of a little bit of an entertainment factor here and stuff though too. And these guys are tired of my jokes because I use them all the time and stuff though. So you, you, watch, you watch the eye rolls over here, so. Okay, so um, actually interesting thing and stuff though, these coyotes have figured out and stuff though, Cars are a part of their, their everyday life. And we've, I've seen coyotes come up to a, a busy street, stop, sit there, look both ways. And, and then, you know, once the traffic's gone, I look behind the mirror, that, car, that coyote's crossing me, crossing behind me. One of our officers actually was working in an off-duty um, security job at a, at a work site uh, near an intersection. He goes, I should have filmed this, but I swear to God, Darren, I was sitting there, watch this coyote come up to the crosswalk, sat down on the sidewalk and waited for the, uh, the beep, for the walk, you know? When that came on, he walked right through the double white, and he, I'm like, no way. He goes, oh yeah. I goes, I, he goes, I cannot believe, I was too dumbfounded to get my phone to film this and stuff though. So again, smart animals that are learning from their environment every day. So just some kind of basic stuff here. I'm not gonna bore you with all this stuff though, but some few things, uh, uh, key things to cue in on and stuff though. Coyotes are 15 to 30 pounds. Right now they look huge, okay? You know, they got their winter coat on and it's been really cold out and stuff though. So think, you know, these animals are really fluffy right now, okay? Um, 
We're just going into to mating season, uh, January through March, where they're pair bonding and stuff though, and then uh, female is uh, actively searching for a den site, okay? So um, normal average uh, number of pups is six. Birth interval is one year. So a pup born this year uh, can uh, go into heat next January, so. Um, typical diet is small mammals and birds that make up 80% of their diet. Okay. They eat small animals, small critters. Okay. Uh, they will eat insects. They'll eat reptiles. Um, they'll eat fruit that's you know hanging. I, one woman was telling me she was watching coyotes jump up and pulling oranges off her orange tree. Okay. Uh, they'll eat you know dead stuff, carrion, um, garbage, uh, bird seed, uh, and the pet food that if it's available. And again, they'll also eat you know our small pets. So again, you know, pretty common, you've got a golf course, you've got rabbits. And with rabbits, essentially the coyotes will find them. Okay. Um, how many people can run 40 miles an hour? R show of hands. Okay, that will come into play later, okay. So coyotes can run it up to 40 miles an hour, um, usually short bursts, um, but they can sustain speeds over 20 miles an hour for a good amount of time, okay and they can jump over an eight foot fence. Um, normally coyotes are more naturally afraid of us and we'll talk about some of the reasons why they're not, okay? That coyotes can breed with domestic dogs, it almost ne ne never happens and stuff though. I, that would be a situation where there was no other coyotes for the, usually for the male to breed with, okay? Um, so this is the kind of the most important th thing here. Highly adaptable, opportunistic, predatory animal, okay? Think about opportunistic, you know, they're gonna go after the easiest meal they can find, okay? If it's, if it's bird, bird seed on the ground, if it's, you know, stuff that dropped off our trees, you know, that kind of thing, okay? Highly intelligent, uh, easily trained, or certainly easily conditioned, okay? Uh, naturally fearful of humans, but that fear is lost in stages, okay? It's removed by what we call proximity indifference. So essentially, the more often that these coyotes are around us, without any negative consequences or get not, 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 not us pushing back, they're learning that we are less of a threat over and over and over to the point where we're not a threat anymore. And that point, they start taking advantage of those situations closer and closer to people, okay? So certainly just tolerance, um, and then we wanna change that behavior pretty quickly is the feeding of these animals, whether we're throwing our table scraps over the wall or actually putting food out directly for coyotes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, again, not naturally aggressive towards larger opponents, um, but we, we do see them go after bigger dogs um, in times when they, um, during breeding season. So they're looking at bigger dogs as either a competition for food resources or competition for their mate. And then as you get, when they start having pup, when the pups start re getting ready to come out of the den, they start looking at those bigger dogs as a threat to their young. So people always ask and stuff though, what are the, you know, you know, people always wonder about rabies and stuff though. Rabies just really doesn't happen in an urban environment. Most issues when we see rabies outbreaks is in um, times when the, the, there's drought issues, so the water sources are drying up and those animals have to go further and further and they're concentrated more concentrated at, at those fewer water holes, okay? So that, you know, typically with any kind of disease, more animals can uh, put together in a smaller place, potential for disease outbreaks to happen, okay? Again, you know, these animals in, in, in our neighborhoods here have not experienced drought, okay? Uh, some of the other stuff is mange, distemper, and really any kind of those canine diseases, but, you know, keep in mind, our, if we keep our pets vaccinated, there should be no issue, okay? So anyone seen all that stuff regarding the, uh, I think it was the, actually National Geographic and Discovery Channel about the chupacabras? Mangy coyote. Here it is right here, so. National Geographic. Chupacabra science, oh come on. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, what happens is, a couple things can happen with, with the mange mite and, and really affects them this, this time of year and stuff though, because it does, um, uh, affect their, their, the, the skin, the hair falls off, 
Uh, a couple things usually happen. This time of year, they usually die of just exposure because it's cold out and they can't keep warm. Uh, but also what happens is they can, you know, they're biting at their own skin. They can die of secondary infections as well. Okay. So this is kind of the main thing that I deal with. Um, and certainly, and I get it, I've got a... <laughs> I got a seven pound Yorkie poo, the little terror. But anyway, um, so I get what it means, you know, to be a, to be a small pet owner, okay? Um, this poor cat here is probably looking for the nearest coyote to throw himself in front of. <laughs> Jesus. I don't know how you get a cat to hold still to do that to him. So, so some of the solutions to keeping our, our animals safe and stuff though, when it comes to cats and stuff though, there's a lot of literature out there and a lot of research that's done and stuff, though, that show that cats usually live about 50% longer lives if they're kept indoors. So I guess the message here is keep your cats indoors, even if you've got to do it at gunpoint, I guess. <laughs> so one thing you don't see is coyotes out there licking those snoring toads, right? So um, maybe once. Um, this is my favorite here, and I'm, I'm sure we get, we've gotten calls on this mountain lion, you know, it was probably reported to us. So when it comes to cats and small dog safety, there's a couple of things and stuff, though. There really is no substitution for supervision, and supervision can be done in a couple ways, though, too, okay? But really, the more times that a pet is left outside unattended, you're really rolling the dice and stuff though. And like I said, you know, coyotes are probably the number one, you know, uh, animal that we, you know, get calls on and stuff though. But, you know, pets go missing, you know, you don't know if it's a hawk or an owl that took advantage of a pet that was out there either, you know. So sometimes animals just go missing. Um, and then certainly with cats and stuff though, most people don't take into account um, the, the four wheeled predators are out there too, and stuff though. So I usually, you know, Usually go at least once a week where I'd see a cat and you know hit on the side of the road. So, so there are some options and stuff though. I mean, uh, for cats, there's those catios, if you will, or uh, something. They called them something else the other day. Um, but this woman here, this is a kit. You know, you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, her garage access door is right on the other side here. So there's a doggy door that allows the dog to go into the dog run, go do its business come back in and whatever. So the dog doesn't have to be cooped in up all day or whatever. Um, only thing that would make this better, uh, and there, maybe there's something down here, but something down here that um, a coyote can't dig under, you know, whether it's concrete footing or, you know, buried hardware cloth or something like that. So um, motion activated lights, um, they're not gonna deter a coyote, but what they will do is let us know that something triggered those lights. So when we go to let our dogs outside, if you go to let your dog out and the, the light's on, you know, you know there's something out there that may have triggered that light, so you go out ahead of time, and I'll provide you with some options you know, to arm yourself to go out ahead of time. Make sure that there's not something waiting out there, okay? Um, walking your dog, uh, leash law in Scottsdale, leash law in the state of Arizona, actually, and stuff though. So you need to keep your dogs on a leash. Um, how many people have the retractable leashes? Yeah, I do too, um, but the, usually they lock down and stuff though. They're great if you have full 360 vision and stuff though, but if you're walking and there's bushes and shrubs and you don't know what's around the corner or something like this, you can just lock them down, okay? Keep that dog close, okay? But if you're out like in a field and stuff though and it's daylight and you can see everywhere around you, you you know, let them run out to the, what, 20 feet or so, you know? Um, but like I said, be aware of your surroundings. Look at places where coyotes, you know, could can sneak up from you from behind, keep, you know, look behind you. I know it's kind of dark in a lot of our neighborhoods and stuff though, so carry a flashlight. Um, you know, walk in groups if you need to, or if you can, okay? Uh, carry a walking stick, um, something that's gonna just throw that coyote off a little bit and stuff though, something different in, the, in your hand that, you know, makes you look formidable, okay? Um, if you encounter a coyote, first and foremost, don't run. Nobody raise their hand that can outrun, or can run 40 miles an hour, right? Right, so Mike here can though. He can, he can run down a coyote. I'm, I'm, I got my money on Mike. So um, you can't outrun a coyote. So 
there's no point in running from a coyote. And actually, running from a coyote is probably one of the worst things you can do, or running from a predator in general. Okay, think about our domestic animals, our cats and our, and our dogs, that, we, that have been raised around humans for thousands of years, that have been domesticated and stuff though. Okay, what happens when you do the laser pointer or run the, run the string in front of them? Okay, that's the innate predatory response is even today, those, those predators, our little, our little pet predators and stuff though, gotta get it, you know, they gotta jump on that, okay? So it, it's just an automatic instinct, okay? So running from a coyote, where that coyote probably didn't care in the first place, now you take off running, that coyote's gonna trot along with you and so what's going on, you know? Um, so running from a coyote is, if that coyote wants to get you or your dog, it's going to get you, okay? So running from that coyote is not gonna do a bit of good. So what you do wanna do is you have a small dog, you wanna pick that little dog up, okay? Keep big dogs close, and then you wanna make yourself big, and you wanna speak in low, loud tones, okay? That's usually when the old guy in front, I wake him up. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> been doing this too many times here. Um, but the other thing is when you talk, you speak about low, loud tones and stuff though, so high-pitched noises can also invoke another predatory response. So a lot of these, how these guys go out and, and are, that are use predator calls, they make it sound like wounded animals. So high-pitched screaming sounds can actually, where you may be dealing with one coyote, you start screaming at that coyote, you might have other coyotes coming, what's going on? What's, what's dying over here? You know, so again, low, loud tones, make yourself big, pick your dog up, make that coyote focus on you, not what's at the end of your leash, okay? Um, chemical deterrence, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but you know, something small you can carry, uh, pepper spray. Uh, if you're gonna get pepper spray, you get ones that shoot a tight stream, not that fogging stuff, but you know, also be aware of the wind if you can. You, kind of last resort. Those usually get you about 15 feet. If that coyote's approaching you, nail them, okay? All right. All right, so then we talk about human safety, okay? Uh, children should be supervised. Hopefully I'm not the one that need to tell parents this. Uh, coyotes consider uh, adults too large, a risk, too large to risk a confrontation, okay? Um, when we talk about the chances or the statistics regarding coyote bites uh, versus domestic dog bites, okay? Every year, Animal Care and Control report, this is Maricopa County, reports roughly about 5,000 domestic dog bites on humans every year. And those are just the ones they get reports of, okay? So when my last Yorkie tore my hand open, because I tried to get the chicken wing, chicken bone from him, that, you know, that didn't get reported, okay? So anyone that ever seeks medical attention, that, that report goes to the county, and then that gets, uh, uh, filed as far as a dog bite, okay? Um, since 1997, we had really started keeping really good records of uh, bites on people or attacks or scratches. We've had 17, no, 21 incidents in the Phoenix metropolitan area. The last one where actually someone actually got bit was in 2017 over here at Thompson Peak Park. Um, girl sat down on the slide, her mom had given her a, um, a granola bar, real kind of crinkly and stuff though. Apparently that coyote was sleeping under the slide, came up, nipped at her and ran, okay? Um, so what we found out later is that um, a lot of reports of that coyote or a coyote sitting next to this apartment complex, you know, it was a, the park backs up to an apartment complex. That coyote would sit there on the, on the walking path and be there every morning between five and 5.30 waiting, probably waiting for someone to feed it, okay? So of those 21 incidents, 18 of those, we know for a, pa a fact people were actually feeding coyotes, okay? Okay, there's bad feeding and there's terrible feeding. I'll talk about feeding in a minute, a little bit more. But the bad feeding is leaving cat food, dog food, or throwing their scraps over the wall, whatever, and they're getting the human-derived food sources. The terrible feeding is, you're the coyote, you come up to me, I give you a reward. Now that coyote knows me as a human is providing them a handout, okay? Crazy thing is very rarely is the, the feeders, the ones that get bit. It's because that coyote knows no difference between me and Mike or Deborah, and they'll come up to people looking for that handout. When they don't get it is when they nip and stuff though. Worst case scenario of a dog or a coyote bite, four or five stitches, okay? Conversely, with domestic dogs, you've seen people um, 
being killed in the state of Arizona, um, people severely mauled and injured um, as well. Okay? No one's died uh, from a coyote bite in the state of Arizona. So why can't you just trap, and, trap them and relocate them? Okay? Uh, one thing, as far as a state agency goes and stuff though, we're in charge of managing populations or managing wildlife. What we've seen before is when we've uh, introduced uh, animals out into the environment, uh, we've seen canine distemper wipe out javelina herds, okay? So some of the things that just the fact of being trapped, it's stressful for an animal, okay? Uh, you're putting that animal in a place where it doesn't know home, doesn't know where the food sources are, doesn't know where the kitchen is, doesn't know where the hiding cover is, okay? It'd be no different than, you know, me taking your wallet and credit cards and putting you in a country where you don't speak the language and say good luck. You know, it, minimum it's gonna be stressful, right? And what happens when, when you're stressed, your immune, your immune system gets depleted, and so it could be a long, slow death and those kinds of things, okay? Um, sometimes it's ineffective. A lot of times, either of those coyotes will come back, pretty good homing instincts. Um, and then also, um, um, all you've done is you've created an open space for other coyotes to move into that area. So if we don't do anything to change those behaviors as to why those coyotes got to the where we're at right now, except though you're essentially just you know perpetuating the uh, the removal over and over again. Okay. Uh, when coyotes are trapped and removed from an area, um, it can cause a breakdown in their social structure. Their their uh, well, you're talking about in a given area, usually have a dominant male and a dominant female, and those are the only two that usually breed every year. But coyotes are very good at compensating for loss. Let's say you start removing coyotes, they may, instead of having six pups, they may double up and they may have 12 this year. Okay, and instead of 12 pups, or instead of one female in heat, you may have three females in heat. Um, years ago, um, the owner from Critter Control told me he removed three, or removed 20 some pups from a culvert and a subsequently trapped uh, three lactating females in one culvert in one, one yard, okay? So we've seen, yeah, females going into breeding mode, certainly may, uh, be going into odd times of year. Uh, one of my licensees told me he thought he trapped a, or thought that there was a pregnant female, and this was a couple months ago that he, he was, that was coming near his trap. He wasn't, he wasn't actively trapping, but he had cameras on there, so. Um, so again, very good at overcompensating for loss. Okay, so solutions. <sighs> Pardon me. So how do we fix this problem? Okay, again, we talked about short-term solutions. There is a list of uh, removal companies that are licensed uh, by Arizona Game and Fish Department back there. Those are current, those, are, those, license, uh, those folks are licensed. Um, they can live trap on, on private property or with permission of the property owner. So if, if a community wanted to do that, they could either trap in the, in, um, the common areas or with, if you had permission or the, that kind of thing, okay? We do recommend that they uh, euthanize all adult coyotes for those reasons that um, trapping and putting those animals out there, you know, there's... Uh, it look, may look like a great area, but in all likelihood, though, there's coyotes that live in that area, okay? So um, in the long run, it's probably better off for those animals to be euthanized instead of relocated somewhere else, okay? Um, that, like I said, that list is back there. Uh, uh, so if you are uh, looking at that and stuff, though, there's some information back there as well. So... Um, well, people say, well, why don't you come and take them to, to, to Flagstaff? And I don't know why Flagstaff always gets the bad rap. <laughs> I mean, I know why Flagstaff gets the bad rap, but um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so when we get involved, it's when those animals have crossed the line. And, and certainly in every one of those 21 incidents where uh, coyotes have crossed the line and have bit somebody or scratched somebody, made contact, okay, we've come in and we've killed coyotes or we've attempted to kill coyotes, okay? Um, when we do, when we get involved, it's always lethal, okay? We're, once we put our hands, and per policy, once we put our hands on a coyote, we <coughs> don't have, the re we, our responsibility is to euthanize it. We're not gonna take an animal that, again, has crossed that line. We're talking about a problem animal that's aggressive towards people. We're not gonna take that problem and give it to Flagstaff, for example, you know? 
you know, because those people don't deserve it either. Okay. So, but whether whether we do it or whether you know you hire a company to do it, um, it's usually a short-term solution. Uh, it can have you can have immediate results, but if you're not changing the issues as to why those coyotes are you know getting bold and be and and pushing the limits. If you don't change those behaviors or those issues, the coyotes, the new ones that are, the ones that are still left, because you can't, can't get every coyote, okay? The ones that are still left or the ones that move into those territories are, you know, you're not getting coyotes that are moving in from the desert, okay? Unless you live on the desert. But even then, those are coyotes that are moving in from adjacent areas, okay? Ones that may just be as used to, used to being around people as the ones you got rid of. Um, there is a list of, from the United States Veterinary Association. There's a list of uh, uh, recognized euthanasia me methods, whether it's whether it's drug, whether it's cervical dislocation, whether it's a, 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 a gun, a bullet. So there's, they're all recognized in the U.S. Veterinary Association. So this was the last year we had good mapping and stuff, though, and we're still working on that and stuff, though. Um, but as you can see, um, these are just coyote calls. Uh, this is one year's worth of coyote calls. Um, so as you can see, they're kind of everywhere. Obviously, we're not getting them here because the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian Reservation, um, we do have an agreement with them, but we don't do anything with their wildlife unless they ask us to. Okay? So um, uh, you can see a lot of that stuff in the, the, the Scottsdale uh, Indian Bend Wash area coming through there. Um, Interestingly, though, this is kind of a crazy area in Tempe here. They figured out how to get over, across the 101 and across the 60, and boy, did they find a smorgasbord. Feral chickens, feral cats, you name it through there and stuff, though. So, and, you know, again, you know, older neighborhood, people that have lived there 30 years or more and never dealt with coyotes, and now it's kind of the norm, okay? Oh, the other one, okay, so see these two here? These were kind of just someone said we're in Phoenix and that, that's all that was posted. Actually, this square is the only place we haven't gotten a coyote call. So I-10, I-17 border downtown, um, no coyotes at, yet, okay. I did remove a javelina down here though. Uh, 7th Avenue and Jefferson, so. Um, so now we wanna talk about long-term solutions and, and things that, that, that work, okay. First and foremost, do not feed coyotes, and like I said, where, where, those, where those animals become a problem and become a human safety issue is the direct, you know, one-to-one -one contact, human fed, okay? But certainly they can lose their fear if they're coming in, finding food sources, you know? And the other part of it though, is if they're finding human-derived food sources, you can be um, unnaturally increasing the local population too, so you may, you know, these populations, you know, go up and down depending on the available prey, prey base that's there. You know, rabbits may be abundant one year, but maybe not the next. So they kind of ebb and flow. Well, what, what we do is we can enhance those, the food sources and then keep those populations artificially high, okay? So removing or altering of the things that, that animals may be attracted to, clearing bushes, shrubs provide, that provide hiding cover, um, that provide hiding cover not only for coyotes, but provide hiding cover for your rabbits, your quail, and things like that. So, so if you, you know these animals hide under bushes, if you can see under there, then they they're seen, and they're not going to use that as hiding cover. Okay, uh, that helps uh, pick up our fallen fruits if we can. You know, not you know not asking you know to to blade the golf courses and you know get rid of all your grass and cut down all your trees and stuff. But the things we have control over, you know, picking up the fallen fruits, um, the nuts, the seeds that drop on the ground you know, clean our barbecue grills and stuff. I mean, think about, you know, when you know your, your neighbors are cooking steaks and stuff, the, the coyote from, you know, three miles away knows your neighbor's cooking steaks, so. So, um, not so much of an issue with garbage, um, but some areas of the valley, these javelina have figured out. Um, the dinner bell is the, the plastic, uh, uh, plastic wheels on concrete is the dinner bell, so every once every week they'll come over and knock garbage cans over. Um, so the other thing is what we're asking people is to push back, okay? Part, removing or not a, doing things to, to not attract them is, is one thing, okay? The other part is, is, is how, how we interact with them. If we don't do anything to discourage them, again, like I said, they're learning from us and they're learning every day that we're not a threat. 
Now, if we can change that, and there's some simple things that we use to reinstill that human fear response in them, um, then that's what we need to do. And, and the more people doing these things within your neighborhood, within your community, the better off, well, certainly the quicker you're gonna change those animals' behavior, and certainly you'll have longer lasting changes as well, okay? So um, there are some things, um, um, so we talked about pepper spray, you know, if you're walking your dog. Uh, one of the things that we've found, I'll go through this here. So restricting access is another thing though. Electric fencing is probably not gonna fly too, too, in too many places in, in Scottsdale. Um, but so the coyote roller is pretty slick invention, um, but there's different ways to modify the top of your fence. Uh, coyotes can jump a six foot, well, they recommend if you have a six foot or higher fence, this is a, a product for you. Um, they make different mounting brackets that go on a block wall or chain link, that kind of thing. So these come in four foot sections, um, found at coyoteroller.com, so pretty easy, coyote roller. What happens is the coyote can't, normally what they would do is jump up, use the top of the wall, and you know, kind of just push themselves up, up and over. So it's two bounds to get up and over. This is essentially greasing the top of the wall. The other thing though too is that also if you get a coyote or a dog, a domestic dog, or one of your pets that keeps getting out by jumping over your fence, this also keep your dog in your yard as well. Yes. Yeah, there's just, you know, all that information's on coyoteroller.com and they have all of their different, um, different mounting brackets and stuff though. So, um, so as of right now, and, and until someone tells me this isn't working and stuff though, this is our, I wouldn't say silver bullet, but pro certainly one of the most effective and certainly cost effective methods at hazing coyotes, okay? And so I'm gonna pass this around. Everyone take a sniff off of it. <laughs> See? So crazy enough, I do, this, I do training for our new wildlife managers, our new officers, and these new guys and stuff though, I got like five or six of them sitting around the table. One guy stick his nose in there, whoa! Next one, whoa! <laughs> I'm like, and it goes all the way around the room. I'm like, <laughs> kids. Um, but the thing it is, though, is, you know, one is they didn't learn from their neighbor. You know, they stick their nose in this stuff, though. Um, but the other thing is, like, you know, did we not take high school chemistry? You know, you, you waft, you know? Okay. So pretty effective stuff, cost effective and stuff, though. I don't know. I was going to need to buy a new bottle because... I have a, I mean, this is, I bought this in probably 2007 or whatever. So I can't believe it's still, still some in here or stuff. But it, um, this cost me 79 cents this time. So probably around a buck now or probably three bucks now with inflation, <laughs> you know, who knows. But, um, but, but pretty effective stuff as an irritant. This bottle says it's an irritant, okay? And what we're advocating is direct application um, this is kind of a little goofy one, but um, this is a, what they call a super soaker. There's different brands. There's the bonsai ones or whatever like this stuff though. This one will shoot up to 20 feet, so I could probably hit the door from here. Um, but there's ones that shoot 30, 40 feet or better and deliver quite a volume of water. So what we're advocating is 10 to 20% ammonia diluted with water. Keep this ready. You see a coyote in your yard or whatever, go out there and nail them with it, okay? And then work with your neighbors. The more people doing this, okay? Essentially, you're doing two things, okay? Coyote comes into your yard. You, you nail him, load him up with ammonia water, okay? Okay, until that dries and dissipates, it's gonna affect their mucous membrane. It's gonna burn, you know, a little bit. Well, probably a lot for, for a coyote, okay? Um, but it's not gonna harm them, it's an irritant, okay? Um, but what essentially you're doing is you're conditioning that coyote to associate the location with this negative experience. You may never see that coyote at your yard, in your yard again, okay? Especially if we're not, there's not a food source there as well, okay? So, um, but also if they know that a human has caused them this irritation, if you're yelling at that coyote, get out of here! Um, you know, you're effectively reinstilling that human fear response in it. So you're helping yourselves, your neighbors, your neighborhood. So we just ask that you be opportunistic. You know, if, if you want to go hunt coyotes with ammonia water, that's fine too, okay? Um, uh, Scott's still PD's problem, right? Okay. Um, hold, please hold all questions till the end, okay? Hopefully we'll get to it, okay? Um, but if, don't forget, okay. So, um, 
Right now, the only time that someone's ever told me that this hasn't worked, I found out she was using lemon scented ammonia. <laughs> I'm like, eh, so you got let flowery coyotes out there or something. So, um, but so um, once she switched to that, something when I play, I said, please call me if it's not working. They, these coyotes were hanging out just below her deck. Perfect opportunity for her to spray them down there and stuff though. So by me not hearing, I mean, she told me that it wasn't working. But so when she switched over to regular ammonia, she hadn't called me back. So I'm assuming that it's working and stuff though. So again, there's things, you know, that are going to cost a lot of money. The, 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 soup, the, ro the coyote roller, the, you know, um, um, hiring a company, all those kinds of things. Uh, modifying your fencing and stuff though. Um, but it's usually kind of like a one-time charge or, you know, it, it's something that you don't have to, 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 to do. You can hire somebody else to do it. This stuff requires time and effort, okay? But it costs relatively almost nothing, okay? Um, so that's what we're advocating. Um, and the reality is we, we need to push back on these coyotes, okay? We need them to be afraid of us. So what happens when those coyotes know that a human, uh, humans are a threat again, we won't, they, when they hear us, see us, or smell us, they're either running away, they're hiding away, but they're certainly not approaching us while we're walking our dogs, because we're now we're the top dog on the block again, okay? We need to push back. Right now, these things are pretty effective. Um, this one's called the Yard Enforcer, um, but um, they'll work year round on bobcats or domestic cats if you don't like them coming into your yard. Um, but this motion activated sprinkler head, okay? Um, so you got the uh, sen motion sensor here, here, up here. This one's adjustable. You can change the sensitivity of the motion sensor. Uh, you can also change the direction of where these things spray. So these go in the ground, you hook your hose to it. You don't have to put a power source to it. These are battery operated. And so when something triggers that, like your motion activated lights, water comes on and sprays for you know a short duration, okay? And then it shuts off. So I thought it would be perfect, you know, if you're overseeding your lawns and stuff though, and you set it for real sensitive, you get your doves out there eating your seed and you nail them with it. Plus you're watering your lawn too, right? Okay, um, but right now, um, these animals don't want to be soaking wet, okay? Um, during the summer, you know, if you're trying to get rid of coyotes using that, you're helping them out. You're probably, they're probably just sitting out there running, set, setting that thing off left and right and stuff though, okay? But right now, when it, with it being so cold out, these animals don't want to be wet. It's hard for them to thermoregulate when their fur is wet, okay? So what we're talking about here is risk versus reward, okay? The, um, in a lot of areas, if there's no risk for these coyotes being in your neighborhood or in your community, and they're getting a reward. There's some available food source for them, okay? We want to flip that up, okay? We want to reduce the reward, I mean, that's by removing the attractants, and then we increase the risk. And when those animals are afraid of us, and there's less food, one, they're not going to be in your community as often or be seen as often, okay? And the reality is if these animals are scared of us again, then everyone wins, including the coyotes, okay? If this continues and stuff though, where it gets to the point where we have to come in where those coyotes cross the line, if somebody's feeding them or whatever, um, we're killing coyotes, okay? So it's not a good situation for the coyotes when we, have to, when we get involved uh, at that level. So how many people see javelina in their yard and neighborhood? Okay, uh, goofy little animal stuff. Though. Look at those tiny little feet. <laughs> I think they just topple over. Um, so a um, lot of myth out there when it comes to javelina. People say that, you know, they're, you know, even just Google it on, online, there's, you know, unprovoked aggression, they, they're, they're blind and all this other stuff, whatever. Um, they, they have decent vision, but they see movement very well, okay? And look at that, those big noses on there, okay? They can, you know, think about an animal that can sniff and smell uh, grubs, you know, eight to 10 inches under the ground. Typically, our, our issues escalate with javelina in the spring and fall when, when uh, people are overseeding and putting natural fertilizers on the ground and stuff though. So they're digging and, and also the ground is really wet. Okay, so they're really digging and causing damage. Um, but they're not, they're not going after your dog to eat your dog. Okay, so most of the issues we deal with is, is property damage, like our eating our desert plants. Uh, if they're getting you at your root, roots, um, we recommend, you know, if you've got desert landscaping, move the uh, rocks back, um, use some uh, 
hardware cloth, cut a little slit, go around the plant, stuff they'll cover it back up. When they start digging, they can't get to the, can't get any lower than that. Okay. Uh, but this stuff, this stuff works great on javelina. Okay. If you've got them hanging out in an area, like using, you know, uh, you know, kind of a, a bedding area, poke a few pinholes in here and just leave it, leave this bottle out there. Okay. It'll, it'll do its job. But spraying them with the ammonia, very effective stuff. Think about, okay, the other issue that we deal with with javelina is, is our dog concerns, okay? Especially medium and large size dog, they're looking at your pets as a threat to them or their young, and they're very good at protecting themselves and protecting the herd, okay? So, but we don't want them hanging around, we don't want them comfortable like these coyotes either, but we do want to push back. So that, that way, there's never an issue when you're walking your dog, because these animals are gonna look at us as a threat. When those animals go after your dog, it's because we're not a threat to them, okay? Bobcats in your neighborhood? Okay, crazy thing is, you know, I think it was right around 2012 or so, uh, bobcats started figuring out in this area where people are, where the food sources are and stuff though, mainly because of all of the, the rabbits, the quail, the doves, those kinds of things and stuff though that are out there. The difference is, I mean, you can certainly use the ammonia on them, but just like a domestic cat, they don't like being soaking wet. So if you see a bobcat hanging around your yard, take your hose with a sprayer on it and nail them. It may take you a couple times before they realize, hey, this is where the, where the bad stuff happens. Okay, again, again, conditioning those bobcat stuff though. But a lot of times you'll see them around places where have bird feeders because those birds are concentrated in those locations. And where you have prey, the predators usually tend to find it, okay? Just like downtown with all of the the doves, uh, the, the pigeons that are downtown, we've got uh, peregrine falcons working, working their way downtown now. So, so again, predators are good at finding where the prey is. Um, but again, the uh, motion-activated sprinkler head, very effective. Um, the good thing with bobcats, I guess a good thing, is um, it's very hard uh, to feed a bobcat, okay? Um, We've seen some people actually you know, leaving raw chicken out and stuff though, which sounds gross, but whatever. Um, and some and crazy thing is usually when these animals are fed, uh, you know, at Cave Creek, they were throwing steaks over to the coyotes. And I'm like, what time is that? I'll be there, you know, <laughs> I'll be there <laughs> catching steaks out there. Um, but again, you know, typically like with, like with cats or a little finicky and stuff though, typically only eat what they kill. So it's really hard to feed a bobcat. So it's a little harder to get them habituated with people, okay? Um, but just the same thing, you know, they, they can get comfortable around people if we're not pushing back, okay? How many people have mountain lions in their yard? <laughs> okay, so like I said, you know, the McDowell Mountains and stuff though have mountain lions. Typically where our mountain lion calls will, will spike is in June and May and June. Uh, for a couple, well, the main reason is because things are, things are dry, okay? So they're either following deer off the mountain down into like our golf courses or our washes, following those animals coming in for water, or they're coming in for water directly themselves, okay? Um, very secretive animals, um, um, very rare that they are seen, and when people do see them, like the, there was a, what, a mother with three cubs um, up on uh, Desert Mountain, um, golf course, I don't know, probably about five or 10 years ago, but you know, a lot of pictures of them and stuff though, but never, they just, just hanging out doing their thing, not, not crossing the line and stuff though. Um, but a lot of the issues we deal with with uh, mountain lions are third-hand information. So people reporting it that they saw it online, uh, that their neighbor heard from another neighbor that there was a mountain lion. Um, so lack, and then lack of physical evidence stuff though. So what we would like, one, is to talk to the person that actually saw it, uh, preferably, you know, a photo, you know, I mean, everyone's got, you know, cameras on their phones. Um, but the other thing is even photos of the, the, the tracks or prints that they left. Um, someone, you know, big, big frenzy down in Santan Valley a couple weeks ago where people were, you know, reporting a mountain lion and da da da, da and they said, yeah, it was a big one. You could even see the claw marks. Well, thank you for telling me that that's not a mountain lion. Mountain lions have, cats have retractable claws. They're not leaving their claw marks in the mud or anything like that. You know, a little finicky, right? You know, I gotta get mud on their fingernails. So, um, but the other thing is, is misidentification. So think about sight picture. So a domestic cat and a mountain lion, roughly the same shape, right? 
Okay, I get pictures all the time with domestic cats and stuff though. People are swear it's up and down, it's a mountain lion. And I'm like, it's right by a curb. I'm like, that's a curb, you know, it's that size. Um, but, you know, okay. Um, but think just, okay. So the other thing is the, the biggest thing that you're looking for is the, the tail length. This tail is longer, it's basically as long as its body. And it would, if it was let to go down, it would definitely drag the ground. So it'll always kind of loop up like that. Um, domestic cats have long tails, but here's where this is our typical picture of a bobcat. You know what we see online. Okay, thing of it is, so bobcats are square. Mountain lions and domestic cats are rectangle. Okay, so size comparison. But crazy thing here in Arizona, our darn bobcats, tail length, body color. So we'll see bobcats that are completely tawny like this. You'll bar like see them just like that. Bar barely see any kind of markings on them. They'll always have these markings on the inside of the leg right here, the, the black bands, okay? Um, but look how long that tail is. That's probably, I don't know, 10 inch tail. So when you say long tail, we're gonna need really long tail, okay? All right, and like I said, get a picture and stuff though, and if you do see it, we wanna know. Um, but you know, our concern is with the interaction. Most of these is just a siding. These animals are moving through a wash, golf course or whatever, and they don't wanna be around us, okay? So, <laughs> this is a community in East Mesa. They were begging me for coyotes. <laughs> so kind of, you know, when you talk about coyote removal and, you know, that imbalance or whatever it is, you know, be careful what you wish for. You know, I mean, at some level, you know, our critters are doing a environmental service and stuff, though. They're eating rats and rodents and things like that and, and, and keeping our destructive rabbit population down as well. So um, this is a lot of stuff we deal with um, is, you know, more neighbor disputes and stuff though. Um, like for example, this guy is probably upset because they're eating his petunias over here, but this guy is, you know, you know, throwing not only, you know, red carpet, you know, but throwing out food and stuff like this, you know. So um, uh, Tucson sector did a, a public service announcement many years ago, and it says you can't just feed the cute ones, okay? So when you put food out for birds, and next thing you, got, next thing you know, you got pigeons and things that you don't want or whatever, or, you know, grackles and all that kind of stuff, though, so. So, actually, Arizona Game and Fish Department sits right here on the fence. How many people know that it's unlawful to feed wildlife? Okay. With the exception of birds and tree squirrels, if your neighbor tells you they're feeding tree squirrels, they're a damn liar. I shouldn't have said that because now I'm on YouTube and that's going to be vocalized or memorialized forever. So um, no tree squirrels here in Scottsdale. Okay. So really, technically, the only thing from a state standpoint is you can feed uh, birds. Okay. Um, but here's, here's a strange caveat. Let's, oh, so here's the wording. Knowingly, recklessly feeding, attracting, or otherwise enticing wildlife into an area with the exception of birds or tree squirrels. Uh, it's a petty offense. Only in county, it's a statewide law that uh, affects counties that have a population of 280,000 or more. So right now, uh, Maricopa County, Pima County, and Pinal County are affected, that, that have crossed that threshold of population, okay? If you know if your neighbors are feeding wildlife, let us know, we wanna get that stopped, okay? Please call our 1-800 number. You can remain anonymous, we hope that you don't. We, we will keep your name confidential. But what will happen is we will send them a letter telling them that's illegal, telling them why it's illegal. Second report, if they're still feeding wildlife, these folks will show up at their door. Guess what? Guess why I'm here? You know, and they'll say, because I'm feeding birds. No. Um, so, um, and then any third report that we get that they're feeding wildlife, they're going to be writing a citation. Okay. 1-800-352-0700. So, for example, let's say if you're the homeowner and you're leaving bird seed out here and you look out here and you see that coyote eating your bird seed, okay, now that act is illegal. Even though the intent was to feed birds, 
If you continue to do this and you know that coyotes are eating that bird seed, now you're feeding coyotes, right? Okay, if you're gonna feed birds, use a bird feeder with a large catch pan. Birds are messy. A lot of pictures on the internet, stuff though, usually the ground squirrels will find, will, you know, find that bird seed. And then what, find, what finds the ground squirrels? Our snakes, you know, so. Um, so kind of it all kind of feeds in together. You know, you can't just feed the cute ones, right? So if you do have issues with birds that are roosting or nesting or, or well, not really nest, nesting, but uh, causing a problem, these bird kites work well at uh, chasing them off. This peregrine falcon one, this is at jackite.com. Uh, pretty effective at, at deterring uh, birds where they, where they roost. Um, and then, you know, as we get into spring, we start seeing a lot of ducks in your pools. Um, get one that's like the osprey, pretty effective at scaring, scaring ducks out of your pool as well. So, working together, getting everyone on the same page. These animals, the wildlife in your neighborhood or the coyotes are simply reacting to their environment. We as humans dominate that environment, okay? So really the only thing we can change, hopefully, is, is human behavior. And if we are creating opportunities for wildlife, that's why they're, they're there, and that's why they continue to be there, okay? Um, if we change our own behavior, and our, and our own habits and stuff though, we could quickly change animals' behavior as well, okay? Um, modify or re resolution of conflict hopefully involves an active and united uh, approach by your community, by your neighborhood. More people within your neighborhood or community that are involved at deterring these animals, hazing them, making them feel unwelcome, you'll quickly change those behaviors and you'll have longer lasting results from changing those behaviors as well. Okay, and as, as you're talking to your neighbors, please, the other thing is those brochures don't do me a darn bit of good sitting in my office, okay? Take as many as you need for your neighbors that weren't here tonight, and you know, you start talking to your neighbors. If you know, someone tells you that they're feeding coyotes, please call us and let us know. We wanna get that stopped as soon as possible, okay? So our message is, you know, I'm talking about living with wildlife, okay? Dynamic process that hopefully, you know, your folks are here to get a little knowledge on kind of what we're dealing with, okay? Um, taking some responsibility if we are creating those opportunities for wildlife. Uh, hopefully we have some responsible uh, citizens and, and neighbors uh, that can assist with resolution and, and being active at discouraging these animals, getting everyone on the, on the same page, okay? So when we talk about living with wildlife, we're not here to say, hey, there's coyotes out there, live with it. We're here to teach you how to live with it so that now we're the top dogs on the block and that these animals are fearful of us again, they're running away, and everybody is, uh, everybody's happy, including the coyotes, okay? This, like I said, thank you all for being here. This helps me out a lot when I come out and talk to this many people at once instead of everyone individually. Hopefully we can get back so that we can enjoy our backyards, our pets are safe, we can you know, view wildlife. There's a reason why all of our phones have a telescopic camera on there. Nobody needs a, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you. Nobody needs a picture, oh, you're my coyote today. Nobody needs a picture from me to you of a coyote, okay? You know, um, uh, big industry with binoculars. I mean, you know, this is pretty typical. You can see, you know, your deer and everything out, you know, in their own space and we can enjoy ours. And then that's what we want to get to. Okay, and I know it's kind of a big ask, but you know, we want you to be active at discouraging these animals. This is our Mesa region, this is region six and stuff though. Camp Verde to Casa Grande to Coolidge down here, everything on this side of the Hacienda River and everything uh, this side of the San Carlos and below the Mogollon Rim. So huge area, there's roughly 40 employees that work out of our office, okay? And those are our fisheries folks, those are our front counter folks, those are our officers, those are our habitat folks. So for um, just some housekeeping here, we are a zero fund agency, okay? So when you talk about, I pay my taxes, you need to come remove coyotes. Um, no. <laughs> um, we don't get any tax money from the state of Arizona, okay? Where we make our money or where we're funded from is on uh, sales of hunting and fishing licenses and excise taxes on sporting equipment. For example, if you go buy a fishing pole or if you buy ammunition, you know, for your rifles and things like this, we get a portion of that back to our state, okay? Our, our region, that, that region, um, it seems a little unfair to us, but we have uh, just four, over 4.6 million people just in Maricopa County alone. So, um, and that's more than half of the population of the state, okay? 
we simply just don't have the manpower to run out and, and, and certainly we're not removing coyotes. The other part of this is though, if we start going out and killing coyotes, people don't like that either, okay? I'll relay one quick little, little story. We had a two-year-old that was at a park in North Phoenix. Uh, coyote, you know, lights went down at the end of the night, stuff though, parents were packing up. They were probably, you know, about 50 feet away and stuff though, coyote ran through, nipped this little girl playing in the sand and we came in, we killed six coyotes. I got death threats because we killed coyotes that bit a two-year-old, okay? So keep that in mind and stuff though. So, I mean, you know, everything it might sound like a great situation is to come in and, and, and remove the landscape from coyotes. One, it's never gonna happen, okay? And it's never gonna be a large, uh, a long-term solution, okay? The other part of it is the funding that we, we don't have the funding or the manpower to do that kind of thing. That's why we provide this information to you folks. Hopefully you can help. Work with your neighbors, your neighborhood, your community. Um, and then, you know, like I said, if the situation deems it where we have to come in and do removal, we will, okay? Um, for the city of Scottsdale and city of Phoenix, one officer for each city, okay? As opposed to 300 and some that we heard the other day, 300 and some Scottsdale police officers, was it 2,000 Phoenix? Yeah, it's 2,000 Phoenix police officers. So all these guys have all these things, their law enforcement duty, wildlife management duties, watercraft, off-highway vehicle patrols, habitat projects, all kinds of this stuff, all within a 40-hour work week, okay? So if you do truly have a wildlife emergency, please call 911. We have our responses based on the situation, and Scottsdale PD knows to, how to get a hold of us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, okay? We do triage calls and respond when public health or public safety is the issue, okay? Uh, most of these calls that we receive require information that we are telling you here now and ways for you to handle your own situation and or you know, who to call if, if that doesn't suffice for you, you can call a, a critter getter, you know, those type of company, okay? So here's uh, Deb's uh, district, which is all of everything below Carefree Highway? Everything Cape, below Cape, Cape, Bartlett Dam Road, everything down here, all of Paradise Valley, and all of Scottsdale. And then Mike's is everything on this side over here too. So, so some party messages. Um, a fed coyote is a dead coyote. Um, that's not always the case, but the reality is most of those issues and stuff though was because people were feeding coyotes, okay, when, when people get bit. Uh, if you hate them, be rude to them. And that's an easy sell, right? You know, if you don't like coyotes, you know, spray them with the, your ammonia so, uh, super soaker paintball gun. Their paintball guns are messy and stuff though, and your neighbor's probably not gonna like that, but effective stuff, okay? Uh, but here's the hard part. If you love these coyotes, be rude to them, okay? Because we want them to be afraid of us. When they're not afraid of us, this is the issues that happen. Our pets are not safe. Um, these coyotes will be bold and pushy. They'll, they'll be following us when we're walking our pets and stuff though, and it just the, the the perception that these animals can be dangerous, okay? It's usually not the case towards a human as far as human safety goes. The thing of it is we can push back so that we, we can walk our dogs and not have an issue, okay? Hopefully be an active participant. I mean, like I said, take, take as many brochures as you need for your neighbors um, and spread the word. <laughs> and we could have used those, that, the rabbit picture here too, right? So um, with that, we will take questions right here, sir. He, he said, I didn't mention air horns, are they effective? Yeah, they're very effective at pissing your neighbors off. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So um, many years ago, um, remember, ever, ever heard of the shaker can? Okay, um, it's just noise, okay? It may get that coyote's attention, okay? But uh, essentially, if more people are spraying, you know, doing the air, air horn, it's, it's nothing, okay? Think of these coyotes as teenagers. You know, if you're all bark and no bite, you know, they're gonna keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. Air horn is just noise. It may be an irritant to them for that kind of noise and they walk, may walk away. Same thing with this, you know. We do recommend throwing this in the middle of a herd of javelina though, pretty fun stuff. Um, but again, you know, that's no longer effective, okay? We do recommend using the direct application of the household ammonia, diluted ammonia, 20% and water, more effective than air horn's gonna be. He asked the question if ammonia sprayed along the wall would be an effective deterrent. Not really. Um, ammonia, um, 
is highly, highly volatile, like, like alcohol, like you're rubbing alcohol, it, it just dissipates, okay? Um, ammonia soaked rags can have a somewhat of effect, but it's not a very, very good effective barrier because a coyote can get past it, okay? You know, if you listen to my counterpart and some of the folks down in Tucson, they're saying if you, and I, I don't even know if I want to say this. They say, if you have a male, go out and pee around your yard. You know, something about the testosterone or whatever. I don't know. Maybe that's what was keeping coyotes out of my yard because I have a, um, a, a 80 pound male um, lab, you know, that's not fixed and stuff though. So maybe, I mean, who knows? I don't know what goes on out there at night, you know, so. Um, but that, that's my method to keep my little dog safe is to have the big dog there or whatever. But he's, you know, 11 years old, and I don't know how effective that's going to be for how long. So, um, but yeah, it's not necessarily an effective barrier. Um, if you're concerned about coyotes, um, you know, if you have a small dog, you can, you know, uh, section off a portion of your yard, you know, use the coyote roller on a section of it or whatever, or a dog run or something like that is going to be most effective. And one of those things where you, you know, you can set your mind at ease stuff, though. Because even with a coyote roller, if you have a small dog, the hawks and the owls aren't going to, that's not going to stop them one bit. Okay, so right here. Real, would a real bright flashlight deter them? Um, potentially at first and stuff though, and it may be an irritant. It works really well on like birds of prey and uh, like hawks and owls and stuff though, flashing light or sunlight across their eyes. Um, it, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna probably daze them and they'll probably, you know, same thing as, you know, but the thing of it is, you know, the coyote's gonna avert its eyes pretty quickly. You know, and again, it's just, it's just light and stuff though, so. Bobcats do go after small pets, nowhere near the, the, the level at what coyotes do, okay? Um, kind of that, you, you, coyote, bobcats will probably eat more cats than small dogs. Just kind of that whole cat-dog relationship kind of thing. They don't like the barking and whatever, you know? We've seen little dogs tree mountain lions before too. Not, I wouldn't count on it, but <laughs> I wouldn't send my little dog to go tree a mountain lion, but it, it does happen. Okay, yeah, so, uh, right here, sorry. Here, like five real quick things. Do you consider yeah. putting out pumpkins to be feeding uh, the wild? <laughs> um, make a mess. Yes, so here's kind of a strange thing and stuff though. I mean, technically, I mean, it's one time a year, okay? They'll, they'll come in and destroy them and stuff though. Essentially, you're feeding, feeding wildlife. Um, but you know, we're not going to come cite you for putting out decorations. Okay. You know, if you know, and that, you know, if you're, if you're putting pumpkins out right now and then you're feeding wildlife. Okay. If it's Halloween decorations, then not an issue. Okay. I mean, they'll still get to them and stuff though. And you'll have a mess to clean up. Best thing is for javelina or whatever, put them up a little higher. Heard that javelina can't jump. Um, we used to say that a four foot barrier was, was good for javelina until we, uh, got some down and they were going there. One of the little ones was stuck down in a, in a little uh, sunken area at Scottsdale Air Park. And these big ones were jumping in and out of it and stuff okay, though. Here's, here's the crazy, like here's the crazy thing with javelina. Almost, almost never are they trying to attack, attack you. Usually it's the dog that you have. And again, same thing. If you have a little dog, pick it up, whatever like that. Think of it is most, most attacks or aggressive behavior from javelina. Let's say you're walking around at night, da, 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 come around the corner, there's a herd of javelina. One may have, you know, seen you, barks, sounds the alarm, takes off the other direction. The rest of them had their head down. You got a little breeze blowing in your face. Those other javelina, something, something's going on. Someone sounded the alarm. They scatter, okay? Now, breeze blowing in your face, you've stopped moving. You've essentially became invisible to that javelina until you, you know, make some noise, stomp your feet, yell at them, You'll see them hit the skids and turn around and go the other way. Okay, next one. Um, is it illegal? Right. And but the thing is, they say you can shoot them. So, oh, I have a gun, so you can't just shoot, can you? So you're you're legally allowed to protect yourself against wildlife if you're in fear for your own life or the life of another person. That legal protection doesn't span property. So, for example, in Arizona, pets would be considered property. Now that's the cover of the law, right? You're also responsible for every round that, that, that you shoot. So 
let's say you miss and it penetrates a wall and shoots another person, that's something to consider as well if that's an avenue that you choose to take. So. Yeah, and, and most cities have a, a rule against discharging firearms within city limits, so that's another thing to consider. But in terms of protecting yourself against wildlife, you are allowed to protect yourself or another person. And, and consider that, you know, these guys aren't going to be the ones responding. It's going to be Scottsdale PD, and it's going to be up to them whether to, to determine whether you've created a bigger public safety situation and stuff, though. As far as, you know, you, you can reiterate to, to us that you killed a coyote that was approaching you, uh, well, that's going to be the least of your worries, a ticket from us, versus, you know, going to jail for public uh, endangerment and that kind of thing. My coyote. Yeah. <laughs> um, I used to love walking my dog in the morning, which is like 7 o'clock, 7.30, mm -hmm. a small jitsu. Mm -hmm. Now when I go out, I've got the pepper spray, I've got mm -hmm. the air horn, I've got the leash, mm -hmm. and I'm okay walking with all of this, mm -hmm. but I'm concerned what happens behind me? Will a coyote come up behind and attack? It, it, it's certainly possible. So, 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 you know, when you're walking, you know, just, you know, keep an eye on behind you and stuff, though. If you can, you know, walk with a neighbor or somebody else and stuff, though. You know, safety in numbers, if you will, and stuff, though. Hopefully, as this goes on to the point where, like I said, if we're pushing back and making these coyotes afraid of us, you're not, those coyotes aren't gonna approach that closely to you. Okay, so think about a coyote's got a bubble around them. Out in the desert, that may be 300 yards, okay? And we've, I've actually seen this stuff though. I'm like, is that a coyote or something? And I took a step, couple steps closer, it moved a couple steps back, you know? So it knew what was safe around them. For example, uh, folks in Sun City are telling me that level around people can be five feet. A lady was telling me she watched a coyote, lady was bending over, you know, pulling weeds, coyote walked right behind her. Didn't care one bit, lady didn't even looked over. So the indifference on both standpoints and stuff though. So depends on the situation. If those coyotes are not afraid of us, then there is more potential for them to go after your dog. If we're, if we're pushing back in our own yards and stuff though, it shouldn't be an issue. The, the, it's not gonna happen overnight, okay? But work with your neighbors, your neighborhood, bring this information to them. Get, you know, get, if you don't feel comfortable you know, going and hazing a coyote, hopefully some of your neighbors do. Okay, it, it, it's not gonna take you know, everybody doing this. It's just gonna take a few of us doing this, ones that can be opportunistic and, and spray these coyotes and stuff though, you know. But put the air horn away, you know, you don't, save, you know, save, 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 your, save your hand or whatever, okay, so. And uh, adding to what you just said, I've been here over 35 years, mm -hmm. okay, and never had an issue for the beginning, the last 10, 15 years, Every year it's worse. I'm worried about the population. It continues growing. So here's kind of a crazy thing when a population, when it, we didn't talk about that here. Um, coyotes within a given territory know how many coyotes can be supported within that location, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. But some of the issues going on is if they're coming and finding a, a, a uh, outside food source, a human-derived food source, that can keep, keep that population, increase that population. So what happens though, so let's say right now as they're going into breeding mode, okay, they may keep some of the young around from last year to help defend that territory. If you got a lot of food sources, good location, it's in their best interest, and it's not necessarily to go after bigger things, it's to keep other coyotes from coming in and raiding the, the kitchen, if you will, okay? So those are some of the things that we're looking at and stuff though, and, and I think, here's what's crazy is usually when it rains, is these problems tend to go away, and certainly in our summer rains and stuff though, but what I think is what happened in the last couple months is a lot of the places where these coyotes usually will go and get away from people, it's, it's, under, it's in culverts, it's, it's under the streets and it's things, places like this, they're probably soaking wet right now. So it's not gonna provide very good cover for them if it's wet, okay? So now we're out moving around. They're also moving around stuff though is young, from the, young of the year are dispersing too. So you have maybe young, dumb animals that are trying to find their niche and find their way. So all that kind of plays into it too. But, and it can be just as simple as we aren't pushing back, okay? We need to take over and make these animals feel threatened by us, okay? And we're not, we're not harming them and stuff though. We're just, you know, we're just pushing back, okay? We want them to be scared.
Thank you, folks, and I really appreciate all of you being here. Thank you.